What do Hermes, Boss, and Nike all have in common? Well, apart from the obvious, these three companies are all customers of Actual, a small business based in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. The company uses large-scale 3D printing technology with recycled or bio-based materials to produce custom architectural and interior elements. They make anything from wall panels and room dividers to terrazzo artwork flooring and more basic furniture like stools and planters. Actual operates with a circular business model in which customers can return their used 3D printed products, which are then shredded and reprinted into new items, preventing waste. I toured their office several weeks ago to find out more about the challenges and intricacies of using additive manufacturing within the context of the circular economy. Spoiler alert, there are quite a few. And Actual's business model isn't the only example of how 3D printing is being used to facilitate more responsible manufacturing and resource use. In fact, 3D printing comes with a whole host of benefits that could help us keep products in use for longer with less material waste, all whilst delivering better end products. In this video, we'll take a look at what these benefits are and how companies like Actual are turning these into positive solutions. I'm Luke, and you're watching The Upshift. 3D printing is one of those technologies like AI or quantum computing that often gets held up as a symbol of the future. But just like those examples, the hype has usually raced far ahead of reality. For years, it was billed as a potential replacement for processes like injection molding. But in practice, it struggled with cost, speed, and scalability. So no, we don't yet live in a world where robots are churning out entire neighborhoods of 3D printed houses. But additive manufacturing, the real name for 3D printing, has come a long way since the hype over a decade ago. Today, the technology is starting to mature. It's no longer just a flashy prototyping tool, it's becoming a powerful manufacturing solution in its own right. And its true strength shines in areas like aerospace medicine and other industries where customization, precision and local production matter far more than pumping out millions of identical parts. Actual was founded in 2017 in Amsterdam by Hans Vermeulen, Hedwig Heinzmann and Martina de Witt. The three got to know each other during their studies at Delft University of Technology. Actual actually wasn't their first venture together. The three first co-founded DUS Architects in 2003, which culminated in 2014 with the groundbreaking 3D Print Canal House project. This experimental initiative aims to construct the first 3D printed house in Amsterdam using a large-scale fused filament printer. The success of the Canal House sparked global interest with architects and designers eager to collaborate. Recognizing the opportunity to turn their research into real-world products, the team founded Actual as an independent hub for designers. They developed so-called XL 3D printing technology and custom design software, enabling the production of large-scale on-demand building products made from recycled and bio-based material. Actual's first product, a 3D printed terrazzo floor, was unveiled at Dutch Design Week. In 2017, they installed a 600 square meter version of this floor at Amsterdam Schiphol Airport. Today, they create anything from floors, walls and ceilings to furniture and interior objects, allowing for unique designs and patterns that can be tailored to any space. Actual is an excellent example of where 3D printing makes sense. It allows them to produce unique tailor-made architectural and interior designs that would be impossible with conventional methods. Unlike traditional manufacturing, additive manufacturing does not rely on specialised product-specific tools such as moulds, dyes, jigs or casting patterns. And so this is a big benefit for a company who's constantly creating customised designs at low production volumes. Actual works with leading architectural firms, designers and high-profile brands, particularly in the fashion industry, clients who naturally seek unique standout products. For example, a company like Burberry doesn't want its stores to feel like any ordinary clothing shop. Many brands aim to incorporate elements of their identity, such as logos or signature motifs, directly into their interior design, especially in flagship locations. A great example of this is the 3D display panels that's actual made for Nike's flagship store in London, Nike Town, which replicated the woven texture of Nike's flyknit shoes. The design team developed a custom pattern to turn a core product feature into an architectural element. 
It's been reported in academic literature that in general, this element of customizability is something that can be used to help increase a product's longevity. First of all, personalized products, as you might expect, strengthen the bond between the user and the product, making them less likely to want to discard or replace it. Also, by personally tailoring the dimensions and function of a product to the exact user needs, the value of a product is significantly increased. It's much less likely that after 10 weeks you say, actually, I think we'd been better off buying that product from company X. When I spoke to the team at Actual, they mentioned that they have received this exact feedback from their customers, that no one's able to offer the solutions that they offer. And this connection between business and user is vital for the kind of circular business model that Actual are trying to implement. Actual has a circular take-back service launched in 2022. The goal of this is to try and extend product lifespans and keep materials in circulation. Customers can return used items, even damaged ones, in exchange for cashback or discounts on future purchases. Actual is now even starting to move away from selling assets individually and adopting a subscription model, letting customers lease materials and making circular practices a core part of their operations. And speaking of circular operations, the interior windows of the actual office pictured here are actually taken out of their old office, which they had to move out of because it was being demolished. They've even kept some in storage for future use. So how does Actual recycle their products? Once the old products are received, they're shredded, sorted by material and colour, and reused as raw feedstock for new designs. Because Actual works with recyclable thermoplastics, materials can be reprinted multiple times. In experimental work, Actual reports to have successfully shredded and reprinted a piece of furniture seven times with almost no loss of quality. The recyclability of their material has other advantages too. If you've ever used a 3D printer, you'll know that prints are not always without their mishaps. But because Actual has the facility to recycle their materials, any misprints or waste goes straight into the queue to be transformed into new pellets for printing. That being said, 3D printing is already an inherently efficient method of manufacture in terms of its material and resource use. Instead of cutting away material from a solid block like in machining or milling, 3D printing creates objects by adding material layer upon layer. Because it only deposits material where required, the process produces minimal to no waste. Up to now, we've only really been looking superficially at the benefits of Actual's offerings and the kind of problems they're trying to solve, but there's actually some really impressive engineering and chemistry behind all this as well. I personally think one of the most interesting things about the company is that they sit at this sort of intersection of art and cutting edge technology. The company's facilities include their office and small printing facility, which I visited, as well as a much larger production facility with eight robots. Actual uses so-called XL 3D printing technology, which has been developed in-house. Their systems feature six-axis industrial robot arms, six referring here to the number of independent joints on the arm. These are mounted on an additional seventh-axis track that provides horizontal motion up to nine meters, allowing for a print bed volume of approximately 170 meters cubed. Whilst the robots themselves are sourced from an external robotics company, the print heads or extruders mounted onto the arms are entirely proprietary technology. Actual's printers are based on a principle known as fused granular fabrication or FGF. Unlike traditional printers that rely on filaments, Actual's systems are fed with granular feedstocks like pellets or flakes. This also helps to drive down costs as the shredded flakes from recycled materials can be used directly as they are, rather than first having to turn them into new filaments. Like a vacuum cleaner, the granular feedstock is sucked through a big hose into the print head, which then melts and extrudes the material as a continuous paste-like substance. The main innovation though comes in optimizing and controlling this process for different materials and applications. Actual offers a wide range of materials, all of which have slightly different properties like melting points and flexibility, which will require unique settings and extruder temperatures. There are three core materials that Actual frequently uses in its products. The first of these is BioPA, a bio-based polyamide developed together with Henkel, a large chemicals company. It's partly made from renewable vegetable oils and currently contains around 50% recycled content. The material has a soft matte look and can be recycled and reprinted at least seven times. This is the material that was used for the floor example in Schiphol Airport. The other two materials are derived from plastic waste streams. Polyal, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, is a material created from recycled drink cartons. 
After the paper and card structure of a drinks carton is removed, what's left is a polymer and aluminium mix, hence the name. Products made from polyal have this matte pottery-like appearance and can be coloured in pastel shades, though not in white or yellow. Actual have established a circular ecosystem with companies like Recon Polymers, who recycle these cartons, and Inner Lab Chemistry, who compound the material, as well as Tetra Pak, who of course manufacture a lot of these cartons. Finally, there's recycled polypropylene, or RPP. This is quite a common material made from post-consumer and post-industrial waste, and has a shinier, more sturdy look and feel. Actual have also been experimenting with some more niche materials though. They for example have a recycled wood product made essentially of really fine sawdust mixed with treatment agents, which according to Actual are also naturally produced by trees. Another recent offering is a material made of coffee waste pictured here in the video, and they've even had suggestions for some even more quirky stuff, like a material made out of recycled leather. As you can imagine, Actual works closely with plastic manufacturers to create new plastic compositions that meet their requirements. Each new material offering comes with a long R&D phase, and it's made even more challenging by the fact that there are multiple knobs to twist on. If the company wants to change how a material behaves when printing, they can either change the recipe or formulation of the material itself, or the physical temperature and other settings of the printhead. Not just that, but this optimization might even have to be adjusted on a project basis, depending on the desired pattern or finish. And Actual's take-back service adds yet another dimension to the R&D stage. Whilst they need to ensure that the materials print well and look good, they also have to guarantee that the material will continue to perform through repeated cycles of shredding and reprinting. Innovation in this area is not just restricted to Actual. A study from Delft University of Technology by Marita Sauerwein developed a 3D printable material from mussel shells and alginate, which sets through a process known as reversible iron cross-linking. This process involves a chemical transformation or reaction for both hardening and regenerating the material, as opposed to melting it. Actual have also been experimenting with different shapes, such as printing curved panels using different shaped print beds, with the most complex project to date being the printing of a hemisphere. But beyond the innovation in materials and hardware, there are other ways in which 3D printing could support sustainable production that are more inherent to the technology itself. The beauty of 3D printing is that a design can be shared as a digital file with the click of a button and replicated anywhere in the world. And as a result, not everyone needs to own a 3D printer to be able to produce 3D designs. They just need to be able to access 3D design software. Companies like Proto Labs and Exometry have already commercialized this idea. They connect users needing 3D printing services with local 3D printer owners, promoting efficient localized production, and simultaneously avoiding excessive demand for brand new machines. As the company scales, Actual's vision is to start building and establishing manufacturing hubs worldwide, using their Amsterdam factory as a blueprint. The company has delivered projects in virtually every corner of the globe, with particularly high demand in the USA, Asia and Dubai. It's easy to see then why producing locally would allow the company to dramatically reduce both the emissions and costs associated with transporting their materials. Speaking of cost, the flexible nature of 3D printing brings another advantage. At Actual, everything is printed on demand, even their off-the-shelf products, meaning that products are only really printed at the point they are purchased by a customer. And so Actual needs very little warehouse space. It also de-risks the business, since less capital is tied up in stock that hasn't been sold yet. And from an environmental perspective, it limits waste, since everything that is printed is guaranteed to be used. Another advantage stemming from flexible production is the fact that small changes can be made to products with minimal hassle. 3D printing makes it much easier to incrementally improve products, since each minor iteration doesn't require the creation of a whole new jig or mould. Also, without any inventory, these changes can be implemented into sold products almost immediately. This means companies like Actual can develop better products faster through user feedback loops. They're able to constantly tweak and change original products rather than having to wait for the next product line to implement their learnings. So having just explained all this potential for cost saving, I'm sure you're probably wondering how much Actual's products actually cost. And the answer is, well, a lot. A hanging screen could set you back anywhere between 500 and 4,000 euros depending on the design and size, and a set of coat hangers comes in at a steep 80 euros for just 4 units. That being said, if we want to believe Actual's intentions, prices should come down in the future. 
In the words of one of their co-founders, We're on a mission to really push or boost uh, circular manufacturing and a different way of using materials in the building industry and also to really democratize the act of making architecture. Whilst they've entered the industry at the high-end luxury sector of the market, they hope that as the technology matures, it will become accessible to more and more people. Actual's design to delivery platform is already said to reduce the cost of custom-made architectural products by up to 50% compared to conventional methods and is up to 10 times faster. Actual are really doing some groundbreaking stuff both in the 3D printing and sustainability space, but of course it's not without its own challenges and drawbacks. We've already spoken about the cost, which is a reason that 3D printing is still very much reserved for high-tech specialist applications and small volume custom designs. But from a circularity perspective, it's not all rosy too. One of the benefits of 3D printing is that you can make really complex shapes. A recent example is this 3D printed car seatbelt bracket developed by General Motors using generative design. It combined eight original parts into one, making it 40% lighter and 20% stronger. But by replacing off-the-shelf standardized and separatable components into a single complex part, there could be implications for the product's end of life. This in some ways goes against circular design practices, like design for disassembly or design for repair. If a single part of the bracket were to fail, it would be hard to repair without replacing the entire thing. And at the end of its life, it would be difficult to reuse the bracket for something new. It then becomes a trade-off consideration of whether the increased performance and material savings bring more benefit than the potential reduction in repair and reuse potential. That being said, there is research being conducted into how circular design principles can be integrated into 3D printing. The same Delft study with the muscle shell material also included a practical investigation into a reusable 3D printed joint that was designed for disassembly. In this example, the designers connected laser cut panels to the reusable joints using a technique known as Z-pinning. How this works is they hold a 3D printed corner piece and the panels in position, and then they secure the joint by filling the voids in the panels and then printing a thin lamination layer over the top, connecting all the parts together. At the end of a product's life, the panels and joints can be separated easily because of what's called a cold weld connection formed between the closure pins and the larger corner piece. This kind of bond is formed when a warm printed layer adheres to a deliberately cooled material, unlike the strong fusion created between two warm layers in a continuous print. This connection then acts as a clean controlled failure point for simple disassembly. This allows the main components to be recovered and reused, and only the small elements of the closure pins have to be recycled. Harder disassembly isn't the only concern around 3D printing though. Some are concerned that as 3D printers become cheaper and more accessible to the average person, it could drive mass overconsumption. Nowadays, open source downloadable designs are available to anyone, and there's a risk that instead of impulse purchasing, we'll start to see issues of impulse printing. The customization element also brings its own drawbacks, which is that it limits opportunities for product reuse. Whilst the product might be the perfect fit for a particular customer, it's less likely that another user would want to purchase that product secondhand. Modular solutions like the one in this study we spoke about could help overcome this. Finally, as I mentioned at the start of this video, 3D printing won't replace every form of 3D manufacturing. Its per unit cost and energy use remains high, and it's also more time consuming. Actual have found a way to use 3D printing as a tool to enable their specific business model and the ecosystem of partners Actual has created around the technology is arguably as important as the technology itself. 3D printing won't save the world on its own, but it can be a useful vehicle to support it if it's used in the right way. A similar technology that sees success in niche applications is flywheel energy storage, something I've covered in one of my previous videos. If you're interested, feel free to check it out. As always, I'm Luke, and this was The Upshift.